All right, so I'm really delighted to introduce our last speaker of this morning session, Dr. Tumbi Nundungu, who joins us all the way from South Africa, where he's an associate professor and program scientific director of the HIV pathogenesis program at the Doris Duke Medical Research Institute, Nelson Mandela School of Medicine, University of KwaZulu-Natal. Dr. Nundungu, I read, actually grew up on a small coffee and dairy farm in rural Kenya, but he's since made some really fantastic progress understanding the molecular mechanisms of HIV pathogenesis. Um, in about 1995, when AIDS was exploding, he received a fellowship to go and do research at Harvard University, where he got his PhD in the lab of Max Essex. There he developed the first infectious molecular clone for HIV subtype C, which is the main circulating subtype in sub-Saharan Africa. After that, he did postdoc research on HIV vaccinology before returning to Africa to lead an HIV pathogenesis program in Botswana, where he worked for a number of years before his um, current position uh, in South Africa. Not surprisingly, Tumbi has been honored with a number of awards, including the Edgar Heber Award at Harvard, the Vice Chancellor's Research Award at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and in 2012, he was just named an HHMI International Early Career Scientist. We're delighted to have him here today, and he's going to be telling us about slaying the beast from within, combating HIV AIDS through biomedical research in Africa. Welcome. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Glossinger and all the organizers of the <coughs> symposium for the invitation. It's a long way for me from, uh, from Durban, South Africa, but it's very exciting to, to be here this morning and uh, to present uh, some of our work that we are doing in South Africa. Um, I have a read, rather, uh, you know, sexy title here, but uh, I'm actually not going to be talking about um, uh, so much about combating HIV AIDS uh, through research in, uh, in, South, in, in Africa. I'm just gonna really concentrate on uh, some, some uh, immunopathogenesis work that we have been doing at the HIV pathogenesis program and at the KwaZulu-Natal Research Institute for Tuberculosis and HIV, uh, looking at vaccine development. So uh, I'm just gonna talk very briefly about uh, the need for an HIV vaccine. Um, talk about uh, some work that we have done on uh, uh, human leukocyte antigen, uh, uh, mediated mechanisms of viral control, and talk about uh, viral replicative fitness uh, in, in chronic HIV infection. Talk about uh, CD8 T cell immune responses and viral adaptation in uh, acute and early HIV infection, and talk about uh, uh, some uh, concepts about how we can use this knowledge about viral fitness and the way, the, uh, in the, the way CD8 T cells particularly drive the virus to a rest fit uh, state and how we can use that uh, knowledge for HIV vaccine design. Like I said, I, I did come a, a long way, so I thought I would uh, start with a couple of slides to just uh, put you in perspective about where we work. Um, this is Durban in South Africa, it's, uh, on the east coast of South Africa. That's where uh, our university, the University of KwaZulu-Natal is located. Uh, this is Durban, it's a beautiful uh, tropical city. Uh, we do have some pollution problems there as well, but uh, on the whole, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a really uh, exciting place to be. Um, these are some of our offerings. Uh, if you ever find yourself in that part of the world, uh, it's a beautiful place to visit. Uh, lots of uh, animals to see, lots of exciting things uh, to see in South Africa. Uh, unfortunately, uh, South Africa is one of the uh, highest HIV infection rates in the world, as uh, it's uh, illustrated with this uh, graph from uh, uh, a study, a survey that we did a couple of years ago um, in one of our collaborating clinics. And what you can see from this uh, uh, particular slide is that the HIV prevalence by age in antenatal clinic attendees reaches about almost 70% uh, in this particular clinic uh, that we work with in South Africa. And, uh, it's a really staggering statistics uh, and shows that, in fact, uh, in some parts of the world, especially in places like South Africa, HIV is not really in retreat. Uh, but actually, we need to intensify our, our, our efforts to try and see how we can combat the spread of uh, HIV AIDS. Obviously, it's not just South Africa. 
uh, this is a, a map that I, I pulled from this uh, website called Gapminder. I'm sure most of you would be familiar with this. And what it shows is the H, uh, percentage of HIV infected adults in different countries of the world, as well as the income uh, per person in these uh, different countries of the world. And uh, each bubble here represents uh, different countries of the world with the size of the, bu uh, of the bubble representing uh, the number uh, of HIV infected uh, adults in each of those uh, countries. And uh, what you see is that countries of Sub-Saharan Africa tend to be very uh, low on this uh, on the X uh, uh, axis on this graph, but they are um, very high on the Y axis, uh, again showing that they have low, low income uh, per person, but very high rates of HIV uh, infection in the, in the world. And I'd like to suggest that the reason I wanted to highlight uh, this map is that although there has been a lot of advances made in trying to look for new technologies and new ways of uh, combating the spread of HIV infection, in the world. I think that given the fact that most of the countries that are affected by HIV AIDS have very low income uh, and uh, it is very unlikely that you're going to uh, make a significant dent in terms of the spread of the epidemic if you are not able to develop a vaccine, despite all, all the other technologies that are being rolled out that have uh, had some, quite some dramatic effects in terms of uh, uh, cutting the spread of HIV AIDS. This is another slide that uh, summarizes some of the uh, newer technologies that we now have that have been proven to be effective against uh, the spread of HIV AIDS. And you can see that, for example, treatment for prevention is being uh, advocated and has been shown in clinical trials to be very, very effective in combating the spread of HIV AIDS with a, uh, an effect size of up to 96%. Uh, and a lot of other new uh, ways of uh, combating the spread of HIV are also uh, summarized here. And like I said, these are all very effective and I think it's very good news in terms of new ways of combating the spread of HIV AIDS. But again, uh, it is my firm belief that unless we develop uh, an effective HIV vaccine, we're gonna experience significant uh, problems going forward in terms of making further gains, given the fact that all of these methods require either behavior change or expensive biomedical interventions such as treatment or very invasive uh, medical interventions such as uh, medical male circumcision. So I think that there is a great need for us to intensify uh, uh, our efforts to develop an effective HIV vaccine because this can be easily rolled out and has, has been shown in, in various studies with other infectious diseases, uh, a vaccine would have a significant impact, I think, on the spread uh, of the epidemic. So our work has really concentrated on trying to understand uh, mechanisms of uh, immune control in HIV and in particular, we have been interested in the role of uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes because a lot of studies show that uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes play a significant role in the control of HIV infection, even though they are not able to completely eliminate. And also because uh, genome-wide association studies, as well as other clinical epidemiological studies, show the importance of HLA as the uh, most uh, significant uh, genetic determinant of control in HIV infection. So as most of you would uh, probably know, uh, uh, HLA molecules present viral peptides on the surface of antigen-presenting cells. These viral peptides can then be recognized by the cytotoxic uh, T lymphocytes, uh, which can then kill these virus-infected cells. They also produce cytokines and chemokines, as well as other antiviral chemicals. Uh, the problem, obviously, in the HIV infection is that viral escape can occur that abrogates uh, immune recognition of virus infected cells. So the way the virus adapts to immune pressure is to mutate uh, amino acid sequences within the viral uh, genome, which can then abrogate immune recognition. The good, thi the good news about uh, this uh, viral adaptation to immune pressure is that uh, escape usually is accompanied by uh, uh, viral fitness uh, costs. So usually when they, you get viral escape, there is also a reduction in viral fitness. But again, the problem occurs because compensatory mutations are common, which can restore the replicative fitness of the virus to, uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the wild type uh, levels. So we've been interested in this question about whether ultimately whether we can exploit the knowledge of viral escape and what we understand about uh, the fitness costs that are uh, incurred by the virus to try and design uh, a vaccine that would be effective. But in order for us to 
to understand this question, we, we've been interested to know to what extent is actually this phenomenon of viral escape occurring and is it associated with fitness costs, particularly in, uh, in vivo, in people who are HIV infected. And uh, uh, most of the work that I'm going to present this morning, uh, particularly on, uh, in, in chronic HIV infection, has been done to try and address that particular question. So in order to address that particular question, we, we hypothesize that host HLA molecules are an important of, uh, uh, determinant of GAG protease. And we wanted to focus on uh, GAG, the GAG protein because uh, the immune system seems to uh, target primarily GAG uh, protein and uh, targeting of GAG has been associated with viral control in other studies. So we wanted to ask whether host HLA class one molecules are an important determinant of GAG protease driven viral replication capacity. Whether uh, viral replication capacity is a determinant of uh, disease outcome in uh, chronic HIV infection, and whether uh, using an in vitro uh, viral replication capacity assay, whether we can identify immunologically vulnerable regions of the virus that would uh, uh, indicate which regions might be uh, good targets for a vaccine that aims to, uh, to, uh, to drive the virus to a less uh, fit state. So in order to do this work, we took uh, 406 chronically HIV infected uh, antiretroviral naive individuals. We determined their viral loads, CD4 counts, and uh, we also did uh, uh, HLA. And then we used a high throughput uh, GAG protease based viral replication capacity assay in order to determine the uh, viral fitness uh, uh, in these individuals. So this is the assay uh, that we used uh, and is uh, graphically illustrated here. So what we did was to take uh, uh, RNA from uh, plasma from uh, this vi uh, virus infected individuals. We did, we amplified the GAG uh, protease gene and then we make a, a recombinant virus using an NL4, uh, uh, which is a, an, an infectious molecular clone of HIV backbone by, extra, uh, by extrapolating the PCR products and uh, the GAG protease uh, infectious clone that has a deletion in the GAG protease gene into, uh, into, into cells. We can then uh, harvest these uh, viruses. We can titer the viruses. And then using a flow-based uh, assay, we can measure the replicated fitness of the virus by measuring uh, the production of uh, green fluorescent protein by the infected cells from days four to six and the amount of cells that we are, uh, the growth of the virus can be uh, estimated by measuring the uh, infected the amount of infected cells between days four and six, and compared with the NL4 back, uh, uh, wild type virus uh, as a as a as a relative measure of viral replicative fitness. So the the good the good thing about this assay is that you can actually uh, it doesn't uh, select for one particular clone in the patients uh, of the patient's virus. It's a population-based assay where you can actually take the entire quasi species of the patient that the patient has and actually amplify that and then use that to make the recombinant uh, viruses uh, which you can then measure the replicative fitness of. So using this assay, we were able to measure the replicative fitness and what I show here is the replicative capacity of viruses uh, from different patients. Uh, and here on the uh, uh, x-axis, is the replication capacity of different viruses as well as the, the frequency of viruses from these individuals that had various uh, replicat re replicative capacities. And what you see is that there's a wide range of replication capacities fr uh, from, uh, from patients that are chronically infected with HIV. We then asked whether viral fitness correlates with markers of disease progression. And uh, viral load is a great uh, measurement, uh, measure of uh, uh, is a great marker of uh, disease outcome in uh, HIV infection. So what you see is that uh, replication capacity uh, correlates uh, positively with uh, viral load yeah, for these patients. And there's a negative correlation between replication capacity and CD4 counts uh, in, this, in these patients. We then asked whether replication capacities vary uh, significantly across various HLA-B molecules and indeed, they do. What you see here is that there is a significant difference in viral replication capacities across various HRAB molecules. And 
Uh, interestingly enough, there was no difference in, uh, di in viral replication capacities across different HLA-A molecules or HLA-C molecules. I do not show you that data here. And neither was there uh, differences across various uh, HLA class two molecules. Uh, so this is not a surprising result, the fact that the replication capacities varied uh, significantly across different HLA-B molecules because we know that HLA-B HLA is the most significant determinant of viral outcome, genetic determinant of viral outcome uh, in HIV infection. And this has been shown uh, previously. And also we, we, so we found that uh, replication capacities vary significantly across different HLA-B molecules, and that some individual HLAs, in particular HLA-B81, which is a, a, a very common HLA-B molecule in the South African, black South African population, that uh, viruses from these individuals had a significant uh, fitness uh, uh, defect. We also found that the replication capacities, uh, individuals with less fit viruses more frequently had protective protective HLA alleles. We then wanted to determine which particular amino acids uh, are responsible for differences in replication capacity and we were able to do this. And just to summarize a lot of data here, uh, we found that the majority of non-consensus amino acids in P24 <laughs> decreased replication capacity, whereas most uh, uh, amino acid changes away from uh, consensus in P17 increased replication capacity, uh, suggesting that uh, most of the uh, immune escape mutations that occur in P24 result in a fitness deficit and that this would be a good region of the virus to target in a HIV vaccine design that is aimed to drive the virus to a less fit state, whereas most of the amino acid uh, sequences away, uh, uh, mutations away from consensus in P17 are more likely to be compensatory mutations. And uh, if one was to think of uh, a vaccine design that is again aimed at driving the virus to a less fit state, P17 would probably not be a good uh, region of the virus to, in uh, to include in that vaccine design because it is more likely to result in uh, sequences away from consensus that increase the virus replication capacity. We were able to identify uh, about 17 codons associated with, uh, diff, uh, with changes in replication capacity in a multivariate uh, uh, model. So to conclude this, uh, this part, uh, what we found is that host HLA1 molecules are an important determinant of GAG protease driven viral replication capacity, and that protective HLA alleles, in particular HLA-B81, may mediate the effects by driving the virus to a less fit state we found that uh, viral replication capacity uh, is a determinant of uh, disease outcome in uh, chronic HIV infection, and that a vaccine uh, aiming to drive HIV to a less fit state should include uh, P24, but possibly not, uh, not P17. Um, we, we have then uh, moved ahead, and we have been interested in looking at the impact of CD8 T cell immune responses and viral replication capacity in acute or early HIV infection. And the reason we are interested uh, in particular in acute HIV infection is because as you know, when somebody becomes uh, HIV infected, uh, they experience this uh, rapid uh, uh, increase in viremia, which is then brought down. Uh, and it is not uh, exactly clear what brings down the viral load to a viral set point, but it is thought that CD8 T cell immune responses, uh, as well as other immunological mechanisms, may play a significant role in bringing the viral load down to a viral set point. And it is well established uh, from clinical cohorts that the viral load set point is an important determinant of the rate of disease progression and the risk of transmission. In other words, the lower the viral set point that you have, the less likely that you are to, sub, uh, to transmit the virus to, uh, to, a, to a sexual partner, uh, but also you have a good prognosis if you have a, a lower viral load set point. So we wanted to determine the impact uh, or the impact of uh, uh, CD8 T cell immune responses and viral replication capacity uh, on viral set point in individuals that are recently infected with HIV. So the key question is, what are the earliest uh, immune responses 
and why uh, does the immune uh, response, uh, particularly CD8 T cell immune response, uh, eventually fail to contain HIV replication? To what extent is viral adaptation to immune selection pressure leading to altered replication capacity and to altered immune responses? And what, what drives lower viral, uh, low, uh, slower disease progression? Is it the viral characteristics uh, or the CD8 T cell, uh, direct CD8 T cell immune pressure itself? So in order for us uh, to address this question, we have been uh, recruiting uh, individuals with uh, acute HIV infection. So what we do is to, to, to go to uh, voluntary counseling testing and centers in Durban, South Africa. Uh, KwaZulu-Natal, like I mentioned, is one area that has very high uh, rates of uh, HIV. And so the HIV incidence is high. And so it's easy for us, relatively easy for us to identify people with uh, acute HIV infection. These are uh, individuals who test uh, antibody negative uh, by rapid testing, but are RNA positive. Uh, we then recruit these individuals as being acutely infected, and we can uh, uh, follow them over time and confirm that they do, in, in fact, indeed seroconvert, and that they, uh, their viral loads do come down, and have a, uh, uh, they do reach a, a viral set point. And then what we have been able to do, again, is to uh, monitor their viral loads, the CD4 counts, determine their uh, HLA types, as well as their CD8 T cell immune responses, and also uh, sequence uh, the virus. And then using the fitness assays that I described before, we have also been able to measure the, the fitness of the virus uh, in those early phases of infection and how the fitness of the virus changes over the course of uh, infection. So this is a typical uh, individual that we have uh, identified in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, from some of our cohorts uh, with a typical acute infection, and you can see that uh, at this first time point when we identified this uh, particular individual, they are uh, uh, viral RNA positive, but they are HIV antibody negative, uh, showing that in fact they are in acute uh, phase of infection. The viral load actually does go up to a peak and then comes down uh, to, a, to, a, to a viral set point. And when you actually do Western blot uh, for this particular individual, you can uh, uh, identify that in fact they do seroconvert and uh, have a, a full seroconversion uh, pro profile showing that in fact they are in, uh, in acute uh, HIV infection. So we have been able to identify approximately 60 uh, of these uh, individuals uh, within our cohorts in, uh, in South Africa. So what we have then uh, done is to measure uh, CD8 T cell immune responses in these individuals using interferon gamma early spot assays, which is uh, uh, commonly used to screen for immune responses. And what I'm showing is, the, uh, is, is, is really a summary of GAG-specific immune responses in these uh, particular individuals at different times post-infection from uh, four, four weeks post-infection to eight weeks and so on and so forth until one year post-infection. And what you do see for immune responses that target GAG is that these immune responses increase in breadth uh, over time, and that this is a slow increase in breadth. Now, I'm summarizing a lot of data here. I do not show you the immune responses that these individuals make to other HIV proteins. But in fact, the most commonly targeted protein uh, in uh, early HIV infection is NEF. And uh, the immune responses to NEF stabilize uh, very early on, whereas in, for the case of GAG, there is a slow increase in uh, these immune responses, uh, reaching a, a, a plateau at around seven months or so uh, post-infection. We don't understand why there is this delayed uh, immune response uh, to GAG, but we are really interested in this particular issue, particularly because um, uh, uh, GAG is an important, it has been shown that targeting uh, GAG and uh, the breadth particularly of immune responses to GAG is associated with the control of viremia. You can see that if you look at uh, the, uh, the magnitude of, of responses as opposed to the breadth, by breadth I mean that the number of epitopes that they are targeting within the GAG protein, whereas by uh, uh, magnitude of immune responses I mean how big the immune response, how many cells uh, per million uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells are actually producing interferon gamma. And, and what you see is that there is uh, the, the, the magnitude peaks uh, early whereas there is a very slow uh, increase in the, in the breadth of uh, immune responses. 
Now, if you actually measure the, try and correlate viral load with uh, the breadth or magnitude of immune responses very early on at, for example, at four weeks or eight weeks, there is no correlation whatsoever between the breadth of GAG specific immune responses or immune responses for the entire genome uh, with, uh, with, the, with the viral load set point or with CD4 counts. But if you actually measure now uh, or try and correlate the breadth of responses at seven months post-infection uh, or at one, uh, at one year post-infection, you actually see that there is a, there's good uh, negative correlation between uh, the breadth of immune responses and the viral load set point, uh, both at uh, seven months and also at, uh, at, at one year post-infection. So there seems to be some uh, kind of block uh, in mounting immune responses early on, uh, which seems to be detrimental to the patient because these immune responses seem to be very crucial and, and correlate nicely with the viral control, but only as you move towards a more chronic phase of, uh, of infection. We have uh, actually been able to sequence the virus and to try and understand what is the phenomenon of how this immune response is developed. And what we have uh, noticed is that there is actually limited immunogenicity. The, the, the vast majority of uh, uh, epitopes that should be targeted uh, in the early phases are actually not, uh, people do not actually make immune responses to these uh, to this epitopes early on. So for example, if you look at this uh, particular uh, analysis here, we looked at about 56 epitopes of which that one of them were wild type. So these are not mutant epitopes. These are wild type uh, epitopes. And there was no detectable responses in 20 of these, or 64% of these uh, epitopes. There was no detectable immune uh, response whatsoever to about 64 uh, of these uh, uh, epitopes, despite the fact that the viral sequence is there and the cognate uh, uh, epitope sequence is there, so they should be targeted by the immune response, but for some reason that we don't uh, fully understand at the moment, uh, there is this limited immunogenicity of CD8 T cell immune responses. And this uh, immunogenicity broadens over time, as I show here in this slide, where I, saw, uh, I show here the immune responses at two to eight weeks post-infection for these individuals. So these are all the viral sequences that we uh, were able to characterize. And you can see here, for example, that you have 132 uh, sequences that are completely uh, wild type. Uh, sorry, these are mutant uh, sequences. You have 78 uh, wild type epitopes here, but only 11 of these are actually targeted early on. Uh, if you then follow these individuals to one year post-infection, you see that the, the number of uh, epitopes that are targeted by the CD8 T cell immune response increases to, from uh, 11 to 24. Uh, suggesting that there's that initial block that might, uh, again, be playing some role in why these individuals are unable to, to, uh, to control the virus, uh, the virus uh, early on. And the other interesting thing is that, actually, if you look at even the epitopes that are targeted, these 78 epitopes that are targeted, uh, uh, you, you do make uh, immune responses both to the wild type uh, epitopes, but also to some of the mutant epitopes. But there is not uh, much change in terms of these early targeted epitopes, these 11 epitopes. If you look at them and look at their sequences over one year, from about six weeks to about one year post-infection, po post you find that the sequences of these epitopes remains wild type. There, in other words, there's no immune escape that is happening for the most part over the one year uh, of infection, suggesting that even, even though you have these limited immune responses, not only do you have limited immune responses early on, but even the immune responses that you make are actually largely ineffective in terms of driving viral escape. And, and uh, again, this is something that we don't understand why it is that even though these individuals are making some immune responses, these immune responses are ineffective, at least if you measure it, by the ability to induce uh, escape in, uh, in, the, in those epitopes. We have also been very uh, much interested in looking in, uh, in South Africa, which is a high transmission area of HIV infection. We think that one of the, uh, the things that could be affecting the ability to mount effective immune responses is that you have a high transmission of already mutant viruses. In other words, the population itself or the virus may be adapting 
to protective host HLA alleles. So what we have looked at is the proportion of host-specific HLA polymorphisms that are adjacent uh, in or ad adjacent to epitopes. And what we find is that there is a negative correlation between viral application capacity and the presence of host-specific HLA-associated uh, polymorphisms. However, we also find that there is a positive correlation between viral load set point and the proportion of host specific, particular host uh, HLA-B uh, specific polymorphisms. In other words, in an area like uh, Durban, South Africa, where there's a high rate of HIV transmission, the virus seems to be adapting so that there is a transmission of viruses that are already adapting to the protective host, uh, HLA alleles that are present in the population. And that even though the presence of those mutations lowers the viral replication capacity, in fact, when you look at whether that lowered the replication capacity or the number of those HLA uh, B specific polymorphisms is associated with lower or higher viral set point, what you find is that those, the presence of those polymorphisms is actually associated with lower, with higher viral load set point, suggesting that these polymorphisms are being transmitted within the population and that they may be reducing the effectiveness of CD8 T cell immune responses because the viruses will be transmitted and the individuals that receive these viruses are unable to make immune responses because the viruses are already mutated and have already adapted to the protective HLA alleles that are present within that, uh, that population. So this is, uh, this is obviously a small sample size. We did this study with about only 60 uh, individuals. And we are, at the moment, we are trying to increase the sample size for this. But we think that these host-specific associated polymorphisms that are co uh, 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 correlated negatively with the replication capacity, capacity but positively with the viral load set point may be playing a, a significant role in driving the epidemic. Uh, and that uh, as, we, uh, you know, as the epidemic in this particular part of the world matures, that in fact the dynamics of what are protective HLA alleles might actually be changing because of the fact that the virus might be adapting at a population level to the protective HLA alleles that are, that, that are in the population. So to conclude, uh, again, this part, GAG-specific immune responses associated with viral control early, but not during the acute phase of HIV infection. Diminished and ineffective immune responses may partially explain the failure of the uh, uh, CD8 T cell uh, arm of the immune system to contain the virus. These diminished immune responses are not fully ex explained uh, by immune escape uh, mutations. So there might be other uh, determinants that could be either host-driven uh, or viral-driven that we don't fully understand. Viral replicative fitness, particularly in acute or early HIV infection, can determine the subsequent cause of disease. However, there is a disadvantage to inheriting host HLA-associated polymorphisms, likely due to diminished uh, immune responses. So in future, like I said, we are trying to uh, increase our sample size with these uh, acute uh, cases of HIV infection in order to understand uh, better the quality and barriers to effective immune responses in acute HIV infection, the consequences and impact of transmission and selection of immune-driven polymorphisms, to define better the precise balance that is required between uh, effective immune responses and viral application capacity for viral containment and better understanding of acute or early immune dysfunction may be key to vaccine design. And uh, uh, finally, I just wanted to uh, give uh, one brief example of uh, a vaccine design approach that we, are, that we have taken using some of this knowledge and, and knowledge from other groups to try and see whether we can design a vaccine able to overcome uh, compensatory mutations that the virus de uh, develops in people who are HIV uh, inf infected. And we have done this by validating um, a predicted fitness landscape model around multidimensional conserved regions uh, of HIV-1 GAG. So just again to reiterate, the idea here is that uh, CTLs, uh, we know they play a, a, a key role in immune control of the virus, but immune escape is common, uh, as I have uh, uh, indicated earlier. But this uh, escape re, uh, is associated with the reduction in viral fitness, but compensatory mutations are very common 
and they arise and, and may restore the virus to a, a fully replicative state. So the question is, can we find a way around uh, this problem and, and be able to design a vaccine that uh, um, drives the virus to a less fit state, which would be beneficial uh, to the patient? So we've done this in collaboration with uh, Arup uh, Chakraborty at uh, uh, MIT. And what Arup and his group uh, have done previously is to identify these uh, so-called multidimensionally conserved uh, sites in HIV gag. So these are groups of amino acids in, in HIV gag that have strong mutational couplings and co-evolve co independently from other groups. Uh, and uh, they have named these regions of the virus that uh, co-evolve independently from other regions of the virus. They call them the sectors. Um, and they have published that work uh, uh, previously. So uh, one particularly important multidimensionally conserved region, uh, which they termed the sector three, uh, there is, uh, has a higher pro proportion of combination of mutations that do not uh, frequently exist uh, or do not coexist at all. Uh, and uh, th so they identified this particular sector uh, in GAG, and it turns out that this sector, which they termed to be uh, immunologically vulnerable, since multiple mutations in this sector are more likely to result in low viral fitness uh, or a non-viable virus, that uh, in fact, that most elite controllers tend to target this uh, immunologically vulnerable region, which they called uh, sector three. And I, like I said, again, this, uh, uh, these elite controllers uh, includes those elite controllers with protective uh, HLA alleles and those without protective uh, HLA alleles. So this seems like a, a way to really approach vaccine design because what you'd like to do is to target such a region, an immunologically, uh, immunologically vulnerable region to drive the virus to a less fit state so that uh, even if you get escape, the escape results in a virus that is not uh, viable or, or is not able to replicate efficiently in the, uh, uh, in the patient. So these investigators uh, next performed a st statistical analysis to predict the energy cost of all possible mutations in GAG, in GAG P24, uh, therefore uh, predicting the, the viral uh, fitness landscape. Uh, we think that this is a, this is a, a plausible uh, approach uh, to vaccine design, um, and that by targeting these uh, mutations that one could, uh, in fact, design a vaccine. Uh, uh, so we wanted to directly test in vitro the predictions of these combinations of mutations that are most likely to be harmful to HIV uh, and those that are predicted to harm HIV viability. So I have listed here in this table, um, which is rather busy, but uh, all I have done is list some of the uh, mutations that they predicted uh, cannot coexist uh, together within the virus. And some of these mutations happen to be in some of those immunologically vulnerable uh, parts of the virus. So, and then uh, Arup and his group had uh, done predictions of the energy costs of introducing each of these mutations. So for example, there's this one 86i mutation, uh, which has that particular energy cost and then this is the energy costs of introducing this uh, particular mutations. And when the two mutations are introduced together, you see that the energy cost there is infinity, suggesting that that virus would not be viable if you were to actually assay it in, a, in an in vitro assay, which is what we have, which, what, which is what we have done and um, has been our uh, contribution in this work. Some of these mutations are HLA associated, some are not. Uh, and some mutations are also uh, predicted to be good. In other words, if they occur together, uh, th they, that results in a virus that, that is very viable and uh, can replicate better than even the wild type uh, virus. So we, have, we did uh, this work by introducing these combinations of mutations into uh, an infectious molecular clone backbone by site directed mutagenesis. Uh, these mutations were confirmed by sequencing we then uh, took stocks of these mutant viruses uh, and electroporated uh, these viruses into a green fluorescent reporter T cell line with mutant plasmids. And then we performed in vitro replication assays as I have described before. And these are some of the results from that work. And what you see is that some of these mutations, uh, if you introduce this mutation, for example, the 186i in combination with this 269e, you result in a virus that is completely non-viable here. So what I'm showing here is the replication capacity of those 
mutant viruses. And what you see is that for some of those combinations of mutations, uh, in fact, you result in a, a virus that is completely uh, viable, or at least you get a significant uh, uh, reduction in the viability of the virus in comparison to the wild type uh, NL4-3. We have also tested some of the good uh, pairs, and uh, for the sake of time, I will uh, skip that, but suggest, uh, but just mention that, in fact, we, di we do see a very good correlation between uh, the, uh, the, pre uh, the predicted statistical predictions that uh, Arup's group did and our in vitro uh, validation assays. And this is really is a summary of that, that the energy costs uh, that is predicted in, uh, using the statistical methods correlates very well with the in vitro uh, replication capacity data that we uh, generated uh, in vitro. And again, this is another way to depict that data showing that the predicted um, energy cost correlates uh, quite well with the replication capacity as we uh, were able to generate uh, in, in vitro. So it, to conclude uh, this part also, functional data compares very well with the predictions and uh, this data confirm combinations of mutations that, are, that render HIV unable to replicate sufficiently or have substantial fitness cost. And this information we think could be uh, used in HIV vaccine design, but obviously I think we need to understand better for different viral isolates in different regions of the world, what are some of these mutations that would uh, result in this uh, fitness uh, deficit. Uh, the work that I've presented today, I just wanted to acknowledge the, the students in my lab uh, who did this work. Um, Jacqueline uh, and Mopo Hadebe are two really clever PhD students that I've been uh, very privileged to work with uh, since I have been in South Africa. And uh, this is their work, as well as Kamini uh, Gaunda, who did most of the uh, sequencing work that I've reported. And finally, um, my institute director asked me to present this slide just to sell our institute. <laughs> it's called the KwaZulu Natal Research Institute for, uh, H, uh, for tuberculosis in HIV. This is a new institute that is uh, supported by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and uh, the University of KwaZulu Natal. It's a really uh, interesting and cool place to do uh, HIV and TB research right in the heart of the epidemic. Uh, Bill Jacobs, actually, who is here, played a significant role in, in uh, convincing the Howard Hughes Medical Institute to fund our institute. So it's just nearly opened, and we are looking for uh, graduate students, uh, uh, postdocs, faculty, uh, collaborators, and uh, uh, so you're welcome to, to visit our institute and also to, to, to see what uh, some of the work that we are doing there. And uh, it's, uh, like I said, it's a really interesting place to do uh, uh, research, but also to build capacity because that's what uh, Africa needs in order to, to be able to overcome some of the uh, intractable public health problems that we have. And uh, these are just really some of the um, uh, beautiful and handsome people from my own, uh, from my own group. Uh, very enthusiastic, and I would uh, really encourage you to come down and, and, and visit. Uh, finally, I have a lot of people to acknowledge, um, uh, the people that have done the work in, in our group, but also we have collaborated with uh, Mark Brockman and Sabrina Brume from uh, Simon Fraser University. Bruce Walker has been a long-standing uh, collaborator uh, of ours from Harvard. Um, David Heckerman and Jonathan Carlson at Microsoft Research helped us a lot with statistical analysis, as well as Philip Golder. And then I mentioned uh, at the MIT, uh, Arup Chakraborty and his, and his uh, um, group have been very uh, helpful to us. And then finally, I would like to acknowledge our funders. We have been very fortunate to have a lot of a large group of funders that have supported our work in South Africa, for which we are very, very grateful. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the talk, very nice. Um, <clears throat> your last data that you presented on the kill mutations in GAG, isn't it possible that they could be comp compensated in vivo by mutations elsewhere in GAG and recreate a, a virus that was able to reproduce? Yeah, so, um, so the predictions from, uh, that uh, Arup Chakraborty and his group did were based on 
sequences from uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of patients. And what they did was to, by statistical analysis, to actually find which mutations are less likely to occur together. So the prediction was that these mutations, because they occur so rarely together in patients, that in fact they have a big fitness deficit in patients at the, and that if you could target them or if you could target the immune system to those particular mutations that you are very unlikely to be able to generate uh, 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 escape mutants that would be viable in, uh, in, uh, in vivo. And so that's what we have done in vitro and the in vitro data seems to correlate very well with the, with the statistical uh, predictions. I should mention that there were some uh, of the mutations that we introduced, and despite the fact that they were in fact predicted not to be able to co coexist, we found that in fact you could, if you kept those viral catchers going for a long time, you did get some compensatory mutations arise, and were able to sequence the virus and actually determine what those uh, uh, compensatory mutations are. So this, this approach is not without uh, risks, I think that, uh, but for the most part, we do find that there's a very good correlation, but I think that it would need to be tested uh, a, a, a lot more rigorously uh, than just in, in, vit in vitro fitness assays, for example, in actual uh, animal models to see whether in fact you do get compensatory mutations that would be, that would be problematic for, for patients. Yeah. Uh, there's a number of indications that in HIV, um, the CTL response is attenuated that, you know, the final steps of maturation leading to fully armed uh, CTLs is, is kind of, is blocked. And I, I just wanted to know what your thoughts are on how the implications of that for your approach. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I think from our acute uh, infection cohort, what we have seen is that a lot of the patients early on are not making the immune responses that they, are, that they should be making. Um, and particularly in HIV gag, we don't understand why that is the case. So in some cases we can explain it by the fact that they already received a virus that uh, was a mutant virus that the immune system cannot uh, target because the key epitope that should be targeted is mutated. But in the vast majority of cases that was indeed not the case. So, um, so I do think that there's some kind of attenuation, if you call it that way, of the CD8 T cell immune response. Um, and I don't fully understand what the reason for that is, what the mechanism is for that, and why we have that block in that immune response. Um, some people have suggested that uh, the initial, when you get that initial HIV uh, infection, that uh, the cytokine uh, storm that you get in the initial phases of infection may have to do may have something to do with that uh, attenuation of the CD8 T cell immune response. Um, uh, whether that is the case, in fact, I don't know. But uh, there is some indication that some cytokines such as IL-10, which are produced in very uh, large amounts during acute phases of HIV infection, might play a role in attenuating the CD8 T cell immune response. So. Um, I, I do agree with you that there seems to be some attenuation, but uh, the exact mechanisms of that I think will need uh, further investigation. I thought that, is this on? I thought that the, in the first part of the talk where you saw a correlation with what you called less fit or more fit HLA alleles with less fit viruses was interesting. And um, I was curious about what you think the mechanism behind that is. Are those alleles just responsible for better immune responses and then you get less replication and less chances to mutate to a more fit virus? Or is there, what do you think the mechanism behind that correlation could be? I think that, uh, so actually, uh, even before our study, uh, people had shown that uh, certain single uh, mutations in the virus um, in key epitopes uh, that, are, that are presented by uh, some of the protective HRA alleles that can result in uh, uh, a fitness deficit when those mutations occur. So I think our data are sort of consistent with that. But what we actually are able to show is that for some of the uh, protective HLA alleles, such as HLA-B81, 
um, the compensatory mutations that arise, um, that the, the, the pathways to those compensatory mutations are actually not that predictable. Uh, and in fact, what you have shown in papers that we, uh, and we have published that data with HLA-B81 is that the, the mutations that are required to compensate for the fitness deficits that you see when uh, B81 epitopes are targeted by the CD8 T cell immune responses, that those, those are very difficult mutations to compensate for. There's not very good compensatory pathways in HIV that would restore the virus to, 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 to the wild type viral replication uh, levels. So, so we think that for some, particularly for some of the uh, protective HLA alleles, uh, B81 being probably the best example, the compensatory pathways are very complex and the virus has difficulties in uh, making those mutations uh, to restore the virus to, to, to a fully replicative uh, state. And I think that that's why we see that. And it's, it's actually telling that some of the, the, the HLA alleles that had the biggest uh, fitness deficit are not the classical ones that are known to be protective. So for example, we know that HLA B5801 or B57, actually people with those HLA alleles do better than people with HLA B81. But in actual, in actual fact, when you actually look at our data, it's B81 that has the biggest uh, fitness deficit. So it suggests that there might be different mechanisms uh, of viral control by different HLA alleles, with HLA B81 being a good example of an HLA allele that, where the mechanism of control is uh, the inability of the virus to compensate for the fitness deficits. But whereas for other HLA alleles like HLA B5801, that actually the protection that you see afforded by that particular HLA may have nothing so much to do with the fitness deficit itself, but with other, other immunological mechanisms. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Yeah, again, congratulations on the excellent work, but the clear presentation. And you know, the early data you showed on the evolution of the so-called transmitted founder virus with respect to GAG actually evolving, and that's consistent with the Amsterdam cohort envelope data, that over decades that the virus is actually evolving to become potentially not only adapted, but more pathogenic, and there's other evidence that the, the set points are actually slowly but surely going up, so that really important disturbing data. But I'm trying to just close on your last work, which demonstrated that there are these, you know, combinations of mutations in GAG that seem to not exist in the population and, and impact fitness. But how do you turn that into either a, a prophylactic or, or therapeutic vaccine strategy? How does that knowledge guide development of a vaccine that would induce, you know, either T or, or B cell responses? Would you be targeting those regions or targeting the other regions? How do you, how do you sort of translate that into vaccine design? So I, I think you would, you would want to target uh, those regions where it is predicted that if those regions are targeted by the immune system, uh, there will be a huge uh, fitness uh, defect. And I think the, the sort of the evidence that that kind of approach can work uh, would come from, comes from uh, some of the elite controllers, like I said, where they, f they seem to uh, target the sector three much more than, uh, than other people within the population. So, so that they target that particular region and the CD8 T cell responses that they make are able to keep the virus in check. However, if immune escape does occur, uh, in those particular regions, that immune escape would result in a virus that is, uh, has a huge fitness deficit or is unable to replicate. So you'll have a combination of the immune, the CD8 T cell immune response that is controlling the virus, that is keeping the virus in check, but should escape occur, then you have a fitness, big fitness defect and the virus is unable to replicate to all type uh, levels. At least theoretically, that's a way it would work, but whether uh, whether the virus would uh, find some clever ways to get around that problem in, vi in vivo, uh, I, think, I think remains to be, to be determined, in my opinion. All right, thank you very much. Thank
Thank you.